across low natty on the pass left side free seat Boudreaux great save You know, it's funny, 60 years ago, John Mariucci told me that if I came to Minnesota, I'd never leave. I didn't know then how right he would be, but I'm glad he was. A Minnesota hockey legend. As a player, as a coach, as a general manager. The godfather of Minnesota hockey, Lou Nanny. It was easy to be with the people here. It just felt like home right away. He's done a great deal for the game here. A really a unique resume. A guy who came from Northern Ontario, played hockey in the U.S., became a U.S. citizen to play in the U.S. Olympic team. And I really think you could argue he became the face of hockey in, in Minnesota. The Minnesota hockey scene is better for him. Here's a guy who has seen everything at every level in hockey, and yet he has not lost any of that passion. He's still in it. It's everything to him. I still consider Louie one of my better friends in life. Trust him with my life. I mean, you just can't get in the Hall of Fame without a good supporting cast, and he's the one that really gave me the opportunity when I was 18 years old. And the North Stars, for the first time in their 14-year history, they go to the Stanley Cup final. I feel if Lou wasn't there, I wasn't coming here. I was pretty, pretty fortunate to have him in my corner. Minnesota selects as a first pick, Mike Medano. Minnesota is very passionate about hockey. It's the same as the passion that I experienced growing up. I mean, let's face it, I would have played for nothing. When I start thinking of all the good fortune I've had in my life and in our life, where we've been, what we've been able to do, you can't dream of a life like I've had. Lou, let's start with just the story of Lou Nanny. Growing up in Sault Ste. Marie, what was that like? Well, it was a small industrial town. The steel plant really was the centerpiece. And we, at that time, had 40,000 people in town. I lived in the Italian district, and there was essentially just all Italians there. My father had a little grocery store that he bought from my mother's father. You know, right across the street, my mother and her sister opened a little clothing store and they just worked from sun up to sundown, and essentially seven days a week, because even before my father would go to church on Sunday mornings, he'd go over to the store and fill the shelves. There was just five of us. Uh, my sister was four years younger, and my brother was nine years younger. As a child, I never had a babysitter. I'd just go from the store back to the house, and everybody in the neighborhood knew who everybody was, and it was a pretty nice place to grow up. Being on the border between Canada and the United States, it was like another world to us because we got the experience of the United States and Canada and it was uh, very nice, very easy. Now this was more or less Little Italy. 90% uh, of the population in this area were Italian. This church here is where we all got married, got baptized, uh, all our sacraments. Some of the houses have been t torn down, but the house that we were born in is still standing. 35 Allen. The house my grandfather built, I think it was in the 1920s, from the stone. He was working in the Sioux Locks and he brought it from there. And um, Louis was born in this house and we lived there all our lives and the church is right behind it. And our parents' store were just up the lane, about one block. Everything was in, oh, I would say a 200 yard radius. Louis's mom and my mom were first cousins. He's just one year older than I am, but I mean, our faith was important to us, our Italian heritage was important to us, the music, the food, and uh, sports. I mean, we were involved in stuff all the time. There wasn't much to do, and in the wintertime, Louis and I and Tony, we played on the streets. In the summertime, we organized street hockey games. We had one rink. I didn't skate on artificial ice till 1958. I was 16. We played outdoors all the time. But we were made for great street hockey games. Great games. 
There's just something in the blood. As Canadians, we're so proud of being Canadians and hockey was the most important thing to us. I always told people, I said, when I was home studying, my grandpa would come in the room and say, what are you doing? Get out there on the rink. I was stick boy for all these teams coming in town, the senior teams. And so a stick would break and they throw it at the bench. I take all those sticks home. I nail them together with little nails, you know, maybe tie some, some metal over it or tape over it. And I had sticks for everybody. So we, we always played street hockey right in front of my house. And all the guys would come to play. And we didn't even have television. It all just centered around sports for us kids. When did you meet the Espositos? Oh, I was probably uh, 10, 11. They lived three blocks south of where I was. And, and we call that sort of the east side, and we were the west side of the, of the Italian district. This is Alexander Street. Um, up here on the right is the uh, house where Tony and Phil Esposito grew up. As the story goes, Tony was playing hockey on the street here, and the ball kept going in. They said, something wrong with that kid. He needed glasses, so they put, gave him a pair of glasses, and all of a sudden he's in the NHL. This is the rink where everybody came to play, and it's called Phil Esposito Park. Uh, Louie and Phil played on several hockey teams together. So 12 years old, I went and tried out for the Blackhawk team, and I made it, and Phil tried out, and he didn't make it. So Phil went home, and his father worked for his uncle at Algoma Contractors and uh, asked him to start a team to put in the league. So Phil played against us that first year. And then the next year he was good enough to make our, our team. So we played together from when he was 13 and I was 13. He's uh, eight months younger than me. We played all the way through till I left to come to Minnesota. How good of friends were you guys away from hockey? A lot because once we got to know each other then, now we played ball together because we both like to play baseball and football together, you know, in the playgrounds and we played tackle football with no equipment out there. He was the quarterback. Louie always had to be in charge. <laughs> he had to be in charge, okay? Phil tells stories about, I see hey, Louie being a ground drawing of plays and you go here, you go here. He'd say, you go over here, Phil. You go over this way, you go and you button hook and I'll throw you the ball. He says, okay, Luigi, no problem, let's go. He says, I've been taking orders from him since he, <laughs> he was 13. Did you guys get into any trouble when you were young? Uh, not really bad trouble. I mean, you know, you're always pulling pranks and doing things. Phil didn't partake in one thing. We had the real west side against uh, our side. And when I was uh, 14, I remember that part, we had sort of a battle against those guys, and I, I was the rock picker for the slingshots and bow and arrows, and we set the other one on fire and the fire department had to come and one kid got hit with an arrow on the head and got five stitches and it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that we ever had happen again because we got in a lot of trouble. So no major trouble. No major Just trouble. Just started a kid yeah. on fire. Yeah. All the Algoma contractors, what a hockey team. We won the All-Canadian Juvenile Championship. There's Luigi Peach, and I'm right beside him. We both got wings <laughs> for our hairdos. <laughs> and I could remember everybody on this thing. Wow, holy crap. To see this picture is amazing to me. We had a really good team, a lot of great talent on that team. In the Sioux, I don't think we lost the game. Louis' team was uh, the 1958-59 uh, team. Then the next year we went all Ontario. So our team was coming up. Phil played with us every second year because he was a year ahead of me. We could have probably played for all Canada. And Tony, as good as he ended up being, never got a chance to play. A guy named Pat Nardini was our goaltender. We played hockey together and that was our whole life. I mean, if you look at the number of players that made the NHL from Sault Ste. Marie, it's amazing. A lot of names that are familiar. There's Louis and Tony and Philly. And, I mean, if you look at, there's probably five guys that Louis played with on the same team. One time, I think we had six of us. There was Ravlich, Ubriaco, myself, Phil, Tony Esposito, and Ivan Boltrum, all in the National Hockey League. And there's so many kids from my neighborhood, and I mean, from the West End, that played in the Sioux. For a small town, we got to tell there was amazing. Louis and I always had fun together. 
So did my brother, Sault Ste. Marie. It was always hockey. For us growing up in Ontario, especially when we grew up, hockey bombed the people in Canada. And all the young boys that had any opportunity to play were gifted. They all wanted to play hockey. That's the kind of livelihood that I've had all my life. We developed a relationship like father and son. First game I played for him, I picked up an orange and threw it at him, which wasn't very good. So all the team was taking bets that I'm not coming back. That was one game and I'm done. This is the picture that was taken of me my last year in Sault Ste. Marie. I was captain of the Algoma contractor team. So we were owned for, by the Blackhawks from when we were 13 years old. So every kid that played with us would have to go play junior in St. Catharines. My folks wanted me to be a dentist, especially my mother because her brother was a dentist. And so when I graduated as a, from high school, Rudy Pillis was coach in Chicago. Chicago owned St. Catharines. So he flies up to Sault Ste. Marie in the summer and says, uh, Lou, uh, we're all set for you, you're going to play in St. Catharines this year. And I said, no, I, I'm going to go play at St. Mike's. He said, no, you can't. St. Mike's is owned by the Maple Leafs. I said, but they don't have a dental school. He says, well, then you're not playing in Canada. So I couldn't play in Canada because they had my rights for all across Canada, essentially. So I get this phone call from John Mariucci in Minnesota. And I didn't know where Minnesota was. This is Minneapolis. Opulent with natural beauty and exhilarating city to live in. I flew down. Mariucci greets me the next morning, takes me, says, what do you want to see? I said, the dental school. He says, dental school? You're supposed to knock out teeth, not put them in, you know. So I said, well, I'm going to become a dentist. So we went over in dental school, and that, that's how I ended up here. How long did the pursuit of a dental degree last? Two quarters. Uh, I, I, I was taking biology and I had to dissect a frog and I finished dissecting him and I took, took the pins and out of him and he jumped out of the tray and I said, that's it, I'm out of here. So I went over and had some interest tests and they told me I had the highest sales interest they'd ever seen, so I switched to business school. When I came down to, you gotta understand, in, in Canada where I was, I never heard the words freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. You're ninth grade, you're first year university, that's it. So I come down and School starts and, and we have a, a team meeting. Mariucci comes up and says, you go over to the equipment room and tell them you need some workout clothes. So I go over to the student manager and I said, I'm Lou Nanny and uh, Mariucci sent me over to get some workout clothes. And he said, are you a freshman? And I, I thought he said, are you a Frenchman? I said, no, I'm Italian. And so, as you would know, the guy told Mariucci that I said that. Mariucci told Sid Hartman, and the next day was in the paper about me saying, no, I'm not a freshman, I'm Italian. <laughs> what was it like playing for John Mariucci? It was special, it was unique. We developed a relationship like father and son. We got very close, very close and also very vociferous be between us. You were both Italians. And, First game I played for him, you know, it's close. We're losing one nothing, And during the second period, I come back to the bench, and Yurkovic was our goaltender, and somebody shot a puck, and he went to catch it, and it hit his glove, went over the net. And, and I said, keep shooting at him, he can't catch. Well, I didn't know John had just been telling everybody to keep the puck down. So he comes down, and he said, what do you mean he can't catch? We're losing one nothing. You keep your mouth shut, I'm not putting up with that. You're telling these guys to shoot high and low. And I said, no, I didn't tell him, I didn't know. We're arguing back and forth. And he said, that's it, take your clothes off and take your uniform off. So I picked up an orange and threw it at him, which wasn't very good. And so all the team was taking bets that I'm not coming back. That was one game and I'm done. <laughs> but I came back, but he continued this on me all the way through where we had really, really tough times in, in between periods. Then after I was through, he said, I had to do it to you. If I could yell at you, I could yell at any of the guys. And I said, yeah, but you, I mean, for three years I did this. I said, you know. It was really a little tough to do, but, but he was great to me. Ain't 
Well, Nanny's 32 points win WCHA scoring title. We didn't play as many games then, but uh, I think we played 26. But that was the first time a defenseman ever won the scoring title and, and won it alone. It was a battle. I remember the guy I was fighting with was Jerry Butler. And I think he was one point behind me. He was with Michigan. Things just seemed to fall in place for me that year. And I had 14 goals, so 14 goals, 18 assists. So it worked out pretty good. When I went to school, when you were a freshman, they gave you what's called a freshman sweater. To tell you, I was there in 59 and they put your graduation year on there when you, they expected you to graduate. You should graduate. My cousin Lauren Grosso lived about four doors away from me in the Sioux. Great player. I convinced him to come to Minnesota. When Louis went to the U, I had no idea where Minnesota was. I went into the priesthood. I was there for six months and I left. When I got home, Louis says, Lauren, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think I can get you a scholarship at the university. And so, Mariucci's didn't see me skate one second. They flew me in, met Mariucci. He gave me a scholarship that he gave to Louis. I'll never forget that. It's some great friends. Guys played hockey with me and I'm still friends with them. When I was graduating, I didn't have any place to go. I didn't know when, I, I didn't know who to even apply for. I was teaching Latin. It was what I was wanting to do in hockey. Louis called me and says, Lauren, there's an opening in, um, in Rochester. They had, they're going to have a new school. They need a hockey coach and uh, they need a Latin teacher. And he also knew so many people here that he got me involved in uh, Kick It Down Here. I played with the Rochester Mustangs, which he got me to do, and uh, got the job. Quick up, quick up, quick up. Let's go, come on, next line, let's go. I owe a lot to Louis. He took care of me. For all the things that he did, it was very, very generous. I mean, that's the way he is. It was something that I'm so glad I did. I gave up five years of NHL hockey, not knowing I was gonna get this, but now that I was able to play in the Olympic team, it was worth five years waiting. Lou Nanny, Canadian born, Minnesotan at heart, is presented by Toyota. Visit your local Toyota dealer today. Toyota, let's go places. And by Tria world-class orthopedic care and sports medicine. After I was through playing and I was in a contract dispute with Chicago, I was playing on the weekends in Rochester. We were making our home in Minnesota. Our kids were all born in Minnesota. Since we were gonna be members of the uh, United States, you know, if I had the opportunity to play for the country, I would. Then, uh, Murray Williamson was named Olympic coach for 68. And he came to me and says, would you like to play for us in the US team? And I said, I can't, I'm a Canadian. He says, well, we're gonna get uh, a bill put through Congress so you can get instant citizenship. I said, well, then I'd be happy to do it. So we put it through and, and I said, you know, I'm an American, but I'm a naturalized citizen, you're all born Americans. And they said, they said, what's the difference? I said, the difference is I choose to be an American. What was the Olympic experience like? It was as rewarding an experience as I can ever have. I, I, I just loved it. It was, it was a thrill. It's, it's so different than just playing professional hockey. Now you're playing for your country. Every minute you're on the ice, it, it's meaningful. It, it's just something you feel so good about, you feel so proud about, and especially when you win, you hear your anthem. And it, it was something that I, I'm so glad I did. I gave up five years of NHL hockey, not knowing I was gonna get this, but now that I was able to play in the Olympic team, it was worth five years waiting. What was the tournament like? How did the team do? Team didn't do nearly as well as we should have. We really were very, very, we had a real good team. A lot of guys turned pro from it afterwards. Herbie Brooks, of course, were on there. We didn't win a medal, and I really think the Russians were better than everybody else. But after that, Czechs, Canada, and, uh, you know, we should have been in there. 
during this time, you lobbied to get Herb Brooks to take your job yeah. as the freshman coach at the U. How did you know that he was the guy? We were co-captains of the Olympic team in 68, and we played in the room together. We were really, you know, close, and he was a, really a good hockey mind, and, and he was selling for St. Paul Fire and Marine Insurance. So when we're flying home, I said, Herb, I'm going to turn pro, and I want you to, I want you to uh, take over the freshman job. I already talked to Son Murray's head coach. We got to go see Marsh Ryan. He said, I don't want a coach. I said, you're selling insurance. He said, yeah, but I got to sell insurance. I said, they moved the practice to 4.30 for me. So 4.30 to 6. You can do that after. Okay, okay. So he finally decided to, to take the job and start there. A lot of you people are really on the threshold of joining a very select fraternity. A fraternity of ex-Minnesota hockey players, someone that's going to wear that M. And there's nothing in your life that you'll find more proud, gentlemen. Let's get ready to go. Come on. I know you were also instrumental in pushing for him to be the coach that, of the team that defined his career with the 1980 Olympic team. What was that process like? Well, Herbie had been coaching at the university now since 67, but now he moved up to the varsity, won three national championships. And at the time, I want him to coach, because now I've taken over the North Stars. So I called him in and I, want, I wanted to hire him. So we're negotiating for two weeks. And I, I'm saying, I'll pay you this, he wants this, and I, I, I'll give you two years, he wants three years. And then he finally stopped and looked at me, he said, you know, we're not gonna get anywhere this way because I'd really rather coach the Olympic team. You gotta get me a job. I says, why do you wanna do that? I, you know, he said, I've always dreamed of it. I said, well, Walter's chairman, I'm on it. Yeah, okay, I'll call Walter, we'll, we'll get you the job. And that's how it happened. So now he gets the job. He had a plan and he could see things like, we go to Colorado Springs for the Olympic tryouts and I'm there, not because I'm on a committee, I, I got players on the team like Brott and Kristoff, guys that I had drafted. So Cam goes through and he, you know, he picks his players and he comes to me and says, I can't win with you know, playing college guys with these guys. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, I got to play NHL teams. I said, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. I said, I'm general manager, chairman of the Central League, which is like the American League. I said, come on down, we're going to go in and say we want to put the team in the league, but the points got to count, because if they don't count, these guys are going to be trying to beat the hell out of your guys, all. it doesn't matter if they lose the game, but if the games count, it's different. He said, okay, let's do it. Herbie will tell you, he thinks that was the most important thing that happened to his team, because now they played, I don't know, 32 games against Central Pro, really good young players, and they played it at the Met, and uh, St. Paul, but they played all over and the games counted. And so they were getting themselves ready against a much higher competition than just like all the other Olympic teams had to play just college teams. Would you have ever guessed he'd have the kind of success he had with that team that year? No, neither would he. I mean, we, you know, we, we were just hoping to get a medal. And, and uh, when you think of that, that's unbelievable. He was a defenseman, and he was very good offensively. In that era, the defensemen didn't play as like they do today, so he was about 50 years ahead of his time. So you decided to turn pro, and it's after the Olympics. How did the early times go with that, with the new North Stars organization? Well, oddly enough, I used to practice with him during the season when I was with the Olympic team. A lot of times I'd go over, they'd ask me to come and practice with him. Caesar, who had gone to St. Mike's with my cousin when I wanted to go, I knew, but then I knew JP and Goldie, so I'd spend time with him during that time. He drives the shot. Oh, Can you imagine in today's game a player deciding to make the same decisions no. that you did? <laughs> Never happened. I mean, my first contract was a personal service contract. No one that I know of ever signed one of those before or since because I wanted so much money and they didn't want to give it to me at first. And so I put other things in there. I said, look, I'll structure it so you can't lose money. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want this much money. I want 120000 over three years, which was unheard of at that time for you know, a new signing. But I said, I'll start a hockey school for you, which you don't have. I'll do every public appearance, which the team won't do. So I worked for Caldwell Press for the first three years. 
I started a hockey school, I, and I did their speaking, and then I played hockey. I said, even if I got to go to the minors, you're still going to make money. So at the end of three years then, then I did that all individually. There was no more personal service. I sold myself to Caldwell Press. I, I got paid for the appearances, and, and I also got paid for the hockey school. Were you always a fair deal maker? Yeah, I, my, I was always happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was always happy with my end of it, or I wouldn't have done it, right? <laughs> North Star fans turned out in record numbers to support their team. Don't any is a good stick hander, and you have to really be careful, because he had a good shot, and he can dig you pretty well. I know it, because he dig me a couple times. Nanny's versatility made him valuable both as a defenseman and a forward not really the type of guy that you really like to play against because he doesn't really give you that much of a break yourself. Even Boston's Bobby Orr couldn't get past Lou Nanny. Burroughs with it, beats over to Nanny, back to oh! Louie Nanny! He was ahead of his time when he first came out of the University of Minnesota. He was a defenseman and he was very good offensively. Uh, in that era, the defenseman didn't play as like they do today, so he was about 50 years ahead of his time. As this team and franchise is just getting their feet underneath them, what were those years like? It, it was different, and, and especially because, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm playing for a guy, Ren Blair, who's really off the wall. You never know what he was going to do, you know, and, and uh, and because I had played in Minnesota and I was known to Minnesota fans, I was pretty popular in the team. He didn't like that at all. But the team, early on, we, you know, we were okay, but then we got pretty good, you know, in 71, we took a good run. We beat St. Louis and we took Montreal to six games. We had uh, the six game, Ted Hansen scored with 0.600 seconds after the red light went on, otherwise we'd have tied that game. We were down three games to two. There's the puck, it's into the net, but the game was over. Notice the lights, the green lights go on. Now, before the puck goes across the net. I still think we should have won the game, but the referee said the puck didn't go over the line in time, and I still disagree with that, because there's a human error in, in there as well. We had beat him one game in Montreal, which was the first time an established team ever was beaten by an expansion team in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And I got the winning goal that night in, in Montreal. We came close, we had some good thrills. What was the following like in Minnesota? It was really good. They, they, you know how society's changed, but if you went to a North Star game at that time, they, they were sold out. Everybody was dressed with shirts and ties and women and ladies with beautiful dresses. And it was like going to a society crowd when you so the crowd there. Hockey was beginning to really take shape here. The Met Center was a you know, state-of-the-art arena at that time. The colored seats, you know, the green, the black, the white, the gold, I mean, it was a raucous building. Back in those days, it was a hard ticket to get it sometimes, and some of those tickets are going like $3.50. That certainly has changed over the years as well. Well, Louis played forward and he played defense. He and I were teammates, uh, you know, so often as a pairing on, on, the, on the blue line together. And I can remember one, one game that we played at the Met Center and he came off the ice and he was complaining about his contacts. I, I can't say, I lost my contact on the ice. And so I said, do you have any more? He said, yeah, I've got some upstairs. I said, well, get, go on up and, and get it. We'll fill in until you get back. And so he went upstairs and he came back and he had the contact in and uh, played the next shift and he came off the ice. He said, I still can't see right. And I said, well, let me, what's the matter? He said, I don't know. Well, let me look in your eye. And I look, he had, he had two contacts in the same eye. Well, that, that's Louie. <laughs> Louis. We had a game in Pittsburgh one night where he started to come up the ice and they had a kid by the name was Dennis Ouchar, who was a tough defenseman. And Ouchar hit him right on the button. And down goes Louie, hits his head on the ice, he's laying there. And I go over to him and I look down and said, Louie, Louie. And he's kind of trying to come through a little bit. And the only thing he remembers is me saying to him, Louie, before you go, can I have your condominium in Florida? And, <laughs> and we still talk about those days. We had a lot of fun together over the years, but Louie was a, a, a tough competitor too when you played. I mean, he was uh, one of those guys that uh, will give you 100%. He worked so hard to get what he wanted. 
and Louis was uh, one of those guys that would go through, you know, glass doors if he had to to get what he wanted. Louis was a very good player, played hard, worked hard, kind of guy I could always depend on, kind of guy that every team needs three or four of them like that, but there aren't always three or four available. Louis didn't look like a good skater. I mean, his legs seemed to be going in every direction, but he could, he could go. He can skate pretty well. He's faster. He was what you call a guy that would give whatever he had. He tried every time he was out there. Bill Esposito and Nanny learned to play hockey together. Oh, Louis, yeah. Louis and I grew up together. We used to play hockey in the street together a lot. You know, there is a guy probably that applies himself more than anybody I've ever seen. But Louis, I consider Louis a good friend, and I like the way he plays hockey. Drew Drouin draws Andre Savard. Back to Lou Nanny. Score! Louis did, I think, marvels. I miss those days. I do. When we were teammates on the North Stars, we always seemed to have fun together. It was a fun place to play. And if you ever needed anything, Louie was the guy to go to. He seemed to know everybody in Minnesota and had connections. He could deal on just about anything you wanted. I liked that part of Louie because he was interesting and he wasn't just a hockey player. He was a guy that was thinking all the time and uh, trying to create the world better for everyone else around him and himself. Louis is a, is a mover and a shaker, there's no question about it. Whether he's on the ice or off the ice, he's always doing something to, to make himself better. And it was just a fun time, it really was. I mean, we had a lot of respect for each other. Once you're in that locker room, then you're a team again. And that's what we remember, we just, we battled for each other, we worked hard for each other. If we played at home on a Saturday night, we would uh, afterwards, okay guys, where are we gonna go tonight? A lot of times, one of us, Louis, many times would organize and say, okay, I've called over, they got tables for us, and we went as a team. To that, he's a good friend and always will be. Uh, it gives you so many memories. You look at them and right away you get a, uh, something to remind you about that sweater, that team, the guys you played with, the years that you had with them, the good fortune. That, you had to be part of that club. I look at this, I think of how fortunate and lucky I was that John Mariucci recruited me to come to Minnesota in 1959. And I can honestly say that was the best four years of my life. I loved going to school, I loved going to college, and I certainly loved playing with the Gophers. When I came here, Mariucci says to me, he gives me a jersey, he says, you're gonna wear two. I says, why? He says, he says, I wore two, I want you to wear two. Then the uh, Olympics were over, I came home and joined the Minnesota North Stars. This is an iconic logo. How it really fit the state like a glove. So they got cuts and blood and everything else in this one. <laughs> we didn't have our names in the back in those days. They wanted to sell programs. They, they felt it was a big asset to getting their programs sold, and which meant that they could get more advertisement in the program. So it was a smart move. But during that time, I played in three World Cup teams and uh, one Canada Cup team. This is a jersey from the Canada Cup in 1976. It's such a difference when you're involved in international hockey than it is in the NHL or college. The, the feeling you have in the locker room is something that transcends the game itself. And, and I think that's why everybody cherishes when they can wear the logo of their country playing in international sports. I really cherish those days. And then your career goes by so quickly and you get the opportunity to play with a lot of your friends and foes and guys you loved and hated. They used to have uh, old timers, alumni, they called it heroes of hockey games and we play all over the United States. And this one is special to me because this is the only thing that I really kept that I have any autographs or anything of. And we were playing in Madison Square Gardens and Gordie Howe was on same team as me, and I, Gordy was always my favorite player. And so I went up to him, I said, Gordy, you gotta sign my sweater. He says, why? I says, I didn't keep anything. I'd like to keep a souvenir, and I want your name on it. He says, okay, so well, then you sign mine. I said, why don't we get everybody to sign both of ours? He says, good idea. So we did, and that's all the guys who were on the team that time. I guess you'd say that this is one I really treasure because I finally got autographs of all my heroes. I'm very, very honored to have it.
Oh, here's Gordy right here, right across the back. He signed in between the numbers, that's good. I don't know if anybody was the idol of, of more young kids than Gordy Howe. He was something else when we were growing up. It's a whirlwind to look at it, and it's so exciting to have thoughts about each of the teams I played on. And, and I guess the best part for me is, when you look at today, sports, you have so many teams with free agency, players moving, and here I am, three teams of different categories. You see how fast it was, the Gophers, the Olympics, and the North Stars. Like one team in each stage of my life, and I didn't have to move around, so that's special. I'll never forget Louis saying that, you know, this guy could always score goals. If his leg gets back, he'll continue to be a good goal scorer. Fortunately for Louis, he gave me that opportunity and took the second opportunity and ran with it. Well, I played for 10 years and I was 36 at the time, so I knew I was quitting. We were playing on February 8th in Madison Square Gardens and we got beat five nothing. And I went back to my room and I got a phone call from Gordy Ritz and Bob McNulty. And they said, uh, Lou, we want you to take over as general manager. I said, what do you think? I got a magic wand. I'm gonna change this thing in, in a month and a half or two months. And they said, well, what do you want? I said, well, I want two years. I said, I, I need some time. So they said, okay, when you get in tomorrow, you come to our office, we wanna talk to you. So I go over to the office so I went there at 7.30 and, and they called me in. They got, you know, 10 board members there and they're questioning me. And one of the questions was, tell us some of the guys you're gonna hire. And I said, Glenn Sonmore. And they said, you can't hire Sonmore. He worked with the Saints. They almost put us out of business. Can't have anybody from the WHA. I said, well, then you better get somebody else. If you're gonna tell me how I gotta run the club and you want me to do the job, it can't work that way. And, and I understand. They said, wait outside for a minute. So I went outside. Ten minutes later, they walked out to Zoki, got the job. So now, we're gonna have a press conference the next day. But I got practice at, at 10 o'clock, and I'll never forget. So I went on the ice, I practiced. Uh, Andre Blue was our coach, and never ever asked me anything on the team. And so, he stopped and said, we gotta do some of the power play. And he said, Louie, you have any ideas? And I knew I was firing him in an hour, so I, you know, and I, I said, no, Andre, you just do whatever you think you got to do. And then 10 minutes later, Doc came down and got me, and 12 o'clock we had the announcement. Let's see if we can find him in here. What we got? You know, it was a player one day and a general manager the next. Oh, oh. some fines. <laughs> okay, this is it. That's how they sent it to me. This file says the NHL file, only general manager to sign his own retirement papers. And this is uh, <laughs> unique. So here it is. It says application to be placed on voluntary retired list. So whenever any, somebody retires, they sign a contract that says they're retired. So something you never expect to see, but I guess it's nice to have the signature of the player. And there's my signature as general manager. You said you wanted a two-year deal, but how long did you expect that it was going to take you to turn a team into a winner? Well, I didn't know it was going to happen that fast because I didn't know in, in June we were going to be able to merge with, with uh, Cleveland. And the funny part about that is when, when the discussion came up at the Board of Governors and some of the owners were balking, don't let them look at you match two teams like that and Sammy Pollock, <laughs> Sammy Pollock, who was the most respected general manager, he's Montreal's general manager, got up and said, gentlemen, he said, listen, I know one thing, when you get one bag of crap and you mix it with another bag of crap, all you get is a bigger bag of crap. We can allow this. <laughs> so that wasn't, you know, too encouraging, but it was, you know, his feelings. We were last when I took over, and I wanted what was best for the North Stars. So I go to this game and I see Bobby Smith. I was playing the Ottawa 67s in Sault Ste. Marie, Louis' hometown. Louis came up to the game because I was eligible for the draft. I was playing against a 16-year-old. Turned out to be a pretty good hockey player. His name was Wayne Gretzky. And so he wasn't eligible for the draft. I'm watching the game. Gretzky had a hat trick. Bobby got two. We'll be picking first. 
There's no question in my mind it's going to be Bobby Smith. I met Lou that night and he drafted me a couple of months later and that was the beginning of what Lou aptly called the new North Stars. Full strength, puck cleared down the ice, racing after it is Bobby Smith. Bobby Smith picks up the puck, moves in, shoots, scores! Bobby Smith! It's not hard to know when you see a Bobby Smith, when you see a Craig Hartsburg, a Steve Payne, a Neil Broughton. We added players like Tom McCarthy and Steve Kristoff later in the draft, signed a free agent that went through the draft named Dino Cicerelli. I played against him as a teenager. Gretzky and I were fighting for the scoring championship. Dino Cicerelli was third in the league. He scored more goals than Gretzky or I scored. And Dino wasn't drafted because he broke his leg and he had a rod in his leg his draft year. But I remember seeing him. Cicerelli wins it for Minnesota. It's hard not to see how electric and charismatic he was. You know, he had that fire. Hockey is a game of intimidation. It's getting respect. It's sticking your nose in there. It's fighting back. You know, once you get that respect, the talent and the passion takes over. And I remember Louie meeting my dad. I'll never forget Louie saying that, you know, this guy could always score goals. If his leg gets back, he'll continue to be a good goal scorer. I mean, he had that kind of fire and passion. I wanted that player. We were the only guy that made an offer to go out there and sign him to a contract. Fortunately for Louie, he gave me that opportunity and took the second opportunity and ran with it. Centers to Cicerelli, a shot and a goal! The 1981 run captures the excitement of the fan base here. What stands out most to you about leading up to that 81 run? Did you see some things in the team that led you to believe it was possible? Well, I think uh, what Sonmore did told me it was possible that we could do anything. Now, you got to remember, the league started for the North Stars in 67. This is 1981. We'd beaten Boston at home, but a North Star team had never won in Boston. We'd never won a game there. We tied games, never won a game there. Well, a wild riot here, O'Reilly. Pull Steve Jensen, pounded him to the ice, and Alex Pyrus pounded by Wensick. Wensick thrown out of the game, came over to challenge the entire Minnesota team. So that night, uh, we were playing in Boston right near the end of the year, and I always checked with some or the day of a game, and he said, Louis, I've been thinking, I think it's time we took a stand. He says, good idea. And he said, we're going to catch these guys. We might as well show them, you know, we're going to do everything it takes to beat them. I says, have at it. Bobby Smith started fighting at the six second mark. And a fight right off. And that looks like Bobby Smith. It's Crowder and Payne going at it. Now the linesman trying to break them up. McCrimmon and Roberts go at it. And Roberts pounds him down. Oh, a fight at the bench. A wild scene at the Boston Garden bench. And the cameraman is right in the midst of it. And that's when he set the record for 406 minutes of penalties. The game ended. There was a jubilant atmosphere in our dressing room. The Bruins slinked off the ice. Both teams knew, hey, this is over. And Glenn Sommer comes in and slaps a bunch of money on the, on the table and says, boys, the beers are on me tonight. And of course, as the hockey gods would play things out, we play them first round of the playoffs and go into Boston and smack them twice. That's when it seemed like they just became so confident of what they can do. So as that run progresses and now all of a sudden, you're going up against one of the great dynasties yeah. in the New York Islanders. When you reach the final and you're going up against that team, what was your level of optimism? I felt good about it because if you looked at it, we, we won every first game on the road. So we'd beat Boston on the road, we'd beat Buffalo on the road, we'd beat Calgary on the road. So I thought if we can win this on the road, you know, we really got a chance. We're in the finals and we all realize that, so we may only get here once in a lifetime and, you know, we're going to give it our best shot we can. It's a childhood dream. Uh, four years ago, we had the worst team in the league and uh, just uh, unbelievable. I am a little surprised. I think we perhaps thought this team was a year or two away from, from reaching uh, this, this level. Glenn was so fiery. And you know what? Our team took on his personality. He gave them so much confidence. He could really motivate a team. And so he had these guys all the way through, and all of a sudden, they're believing we can do this. Islanders had won the one cup the year before. I actually broadcast that game. Dan Kelly and I did the championship game there. The pass, the nice to the 
first time in her history since they came in with an expansion in 1972. This hockey club has won the Stanley Cup. And they were great. But I thought if we could steal this game, now we get in the driver's seat and our guys, are, they're feeling confident about it. We were starting good, but then we had two short-handed goals, I think, against us. And that changed the game. They, they got, they came back and beat us in that game and that sort of set the t tone for the series. And the Islanders become only the sixth team in NHL history to capture back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. The Islanders were terrific and they, they were obviously the better team, but we really had a group of guys that worked together. You know, I always used to say, you guys have to remember one thing. I don't care if you get along outside, but in the locker room, you're a family, and you better be there for one another. And it uh, certainly created a, a broader fan base for us throughout the state and obviously throughout the hockey world. So what did you learn from that 81 run that then helped you prepare for future years, putting a team together, needing different types of pieces to go forward? Well, I think that, that was it, that you, you, know, you, can't all, you can't have all the same players. We were good for a long time. I, you know, we had 76 playoff games in seven years there. So we were a talented team. You know, you talk about culture now, does the culture come first or winning come first? That's something I don't know if anybody can prove. But when you have that culture in the locker room, you got to leg up when you go into battle because there are going to be times when you're not at your best. You got to find a way to win. And, and our guys at that time had a, had a mentality they can find a way to win. Louis was in his 30s then, you know, he was a dynamic guy. The coach changed the lines during the game, but clearly Lou was the boss. He was a manager, and he wasn't a coach. And I remember another year, he took over behind the bench, and it was the right move, and we won a playoff series against uh, Toronto that we, that we wouldn't have won. He would do whatever it took to make the Minnesota North Stars better. The stability comes from the general manager, I think I played in the NHL 15 years, probably 11 different coaches, four different managers. So, you know, that uh, kind of speaks to the stability, the way uh, I think a hockey team should be run. You know, Lou was very purposeful. He really wanted the people around him to be taken care of. That was one of my first thoughts. When you show him that kind of loyalty on both sides, it's a good side. When you look at the team in today's mold, I mean, they had a little bit of everything. In modern day age, that team would still be you know, a top quarter of the league. So it was really well assembled. Unfortunately, back then, there were dynasties. You know, when you had the Islanders, and then you had like maybe a year off, and then you ran into the Oilers. So if it weren't for that, uh, I'm sure one of those teams could have won a cup. Cicerelli gets it off, and a lead in and a score by Cicerelli. You get an opportunity to play in the playoffs and go a long way. You know, you, you think, like we did back then, that this is just going to happen every year. But uh, it took me 15 years after that to get back to the finals again. And uh, I feel pretty fortunate that I got a second chance to play this game and, and, and not only play, you know, succeed and, and, and last a long time. When I got the call for the Hall of Fame, it kind of puts a, uh, you know, makes you feel a little more accomplished. I mean, you just can't get in the Hall of Fame without a good supporting cast. And I guess it all starts with Lou Nanny, you know, um, he's the one that really gave me the opportunity. When I was 18 years old, it's such an honor to be part of the Hockey Hall of Fame, and, and I'm grateful to Lou Nanny. He said I could score goals prior to breaking my leg, and if we got the leg back in shape, he'd score goals again. And I ran with that opportunity. I thank you all. I've had a great time, thanks to the Hall of Fame. And thank you and good night, everybody. Louie comes to me and he says, let's you and I and Tony make a deal. Three guys from the Sioux, from the same neighborhood. But Tony wouldn't participate because he says, you two guys are gonna screw me. <laughs> Louie's a smart guy, he's a good businessman. I mean, that's the job of the general manager is to make your team the best that you can make them. Louis was the kind of guy that was always on the telephone, always trying to make a deal. He was called Trader Lou, and he had certain people that they made a lot of trades. They were rivals, but they became very close friends. 
The year that I became the manager and coach in Edmonton, we had Gretzky, we had a pretty good team, but uh, we went to the draft in Montreal that year. I wanted to keep Dave Semenko, he was really a tough guy. Turned out to be Wayne Gretzky's kind of bodyguard all those years. So I called Louis, we made a deal, that's the first deal we made together. I gave Louis a second round pick for Dave Semenko, but it worked out well for us. Louis always says he got the best of me on that one. He kind of built the team on draft picks. They had a pretty good run for the playoffs, and they were always a, a close threat. Louis and I had a kind of a same philosophy. Took it from baseball. If I had a 270 hitter, and I could get a 278 hitter, it makes about the same money, but his personality is just a little bit more gregarious and better to meld into the team, I'd do it. I think Louis would do it too. Sometimes chemistry on a team is better than the talent. Back in those days, you had to be resourceful to track down general managers. Who was the general manager you had to track down in Europe one time to make a deal? Craig Patrick was the general manager of New York Rangers, and uh, we had a defenseman, Yuri Gronstrand, that our people didn't feel we should keep any longer. And they really, our scouts really liked us. Dave Gagne, I hadn't even seen Dave play. So I called New York office and I asked his assistant, uh, can I speak to Craig? And she says, he went to Sweden. I says, where? She says, I don't know. I said, okay, thanks. So I hung up, I got out my book for all the games in the world. And I looked in Sweden and saw who was playing and where would I go if I was going to Sweden? So there's a little town, I can't even remember the name, but way up north of Stockholm. So in those days, you could call the operator. I called the operator there and asked for, give me the uh, telephone number for the nicest hotel you have. And so they gave me this number of this hotel. So I called the hotel and I said, I want to talk to Craig Patrick. And the guy says, Mr. Patrick left here 10 minutes ago. I said, what time is it there? And they said, six o'clock in the evening. I said, what's the best restaurant you got in town? So he told me, I said, give me the number. So he gave me the number and I called the restaurant and I said, you got a thin balding guy in there, just came in for dinner. His name's Craig Patrick. Tell him to come to the telephone. So <laughs> Craig comes to the phone, hello. I said, Craig, it's Louie. How'd you find me? I didn't know I was coming here until 10 minutes ago. I said, oh, I got ways. <laughs> And we talked, and that's when I made a deal. We gave him Gronstein, and we got Kanye back. What was the toughest trade you ever made? Well, it was Bobby Smith. I didn't want to trade him. You know, it was, uh, he came in. He felt he wasn't getting enough ice time. I thought I was a better player than the coach thought I was, and that's what it came down to. And I said to Louis that this isn't working, and uh, you're going to have to trade me. So I said, okay, don't tell anybody you want to trade because it's going to, make it tougher to get value for you, so. And he traded me, and it turned out to be a very good move for me. Played seven years for the Montreal Canadiens, won the Stanley Cup. I had tons of respect for Lou when I, when I saw him, we spoke. Uh, he understand, uh, understood it was part of the business. He brought in two very good players and a draft pick when he traded me. He was happy he got his cup. I was happy because we got some good value for him story of at the draft one year and you and both of your old buddies the espositos oh. are general managers of other teams yeah. so you got three guys from within two blocks of each other yeah. all as general managers simultaneously what do you remember about that draft night well we were five minutes before the draft started and i'm sitting at this table and a couple tables over is new york rangers and next to them is pittsburgh and phil's general espositos general manager in new york and Tony's general manager of Pittsburgh. Louis comes to me and he says, look, let's you and I and Tony make a deal. Three guys from the Sioux, from the same neighborhood, general managers. I said, I've made so many trades, I can't count. I said, let's make the last one amongst us so we have something to remember. But Tony wouldn't participate because he says, you two guys are gonna screw me. <laughs> I said, no, I said, Phil, what do you need? He says, I need a left winger. I said, I need a defenseman. What do you need? Tony? Nothing. I'm not dealing with you guys. But we're not going to do anything, Tony. We're just going to make a deal. The three guys from the Sioux. Tony says, I'm not making a deal with either one of you two. 
Louis and I had made the deal anyway. It was in February of 1988, and my scouts were telling me I got to get out to see this player, Mike Madonna, American kid from suburb of Detroit playing in Prince Albert. So I went out there and, and I saw Mike play. And I came back and uh, I said, we got an opportunity, I think we're gonna get a franchise player. I saw a kid that brings you out of your seats, he's got a lot of charisma, and he's tremendously talented. We're not selling enough tickets right now, this kid can sell tickets. Who is going to be the number one draft pick overall? Will it be Mike Medano? Will it be Trevor Linden? I feel if Lou wasn't there, I wasn't coming here. There's no chance. Lou put in a hard sale for me, so pretty fortunate to have him in my corner. We didn't know who was going where until he walked up to the podium, and that was it. Minnesota selects as the first pick in the 1988 entry draft from Prince Albert, Mike Medano. His idea was to keep it a surprise, which was kind of cool. I just remember he, uh, he had the number on there, so I was like, oh, so you knew that? Because no, we didn't know. 16's under the table at the draft table, so. So we had a little short giggle, and he was excited. He was like, man, I'm glad this worked out. We're, we're excited for you. It's something that only the future can tell, but we know that we needed a talented centerman, somebody that's capable of, in the future, being an excellent player, and, and we think he can do that for us. He was my last first round pick. I, I knew he was great. I didn't know he was gonna be a Hall of Fame player. You hoped that he could be. He's the guy that really made the North Stars leave on a good note. I owe a lot to Lou for starting here. Career-wise, I couldn't imagine it going that long and being around the teams I had and the success we've had. And, you know, there's an emotional tie. You start your career here. State of hockey is, you know, there's nothing like this in the, in the country here. He's the voice of the state tournament. He will always be, you know, until he hangs up. He's, he started doing this 59 years ago. Let's go back to switching to life after hockey. So you've decided to step away from the general manager. A part of, actually a part of your career while you still were the GM was TV. What was the, your early experience like in the TV business? Well, in 63, when I graduated and I didn't play, I was coaching a freshman working, and uh, I get a call from WTCN, which is Channel 11. They said, Louie, come on down. We want to talk to you about uh, broadcasting. So I went down, and they said, we'd like you to broadcast the state high school tournament. And i never done TV as a broadcaster, been interviewed, but never did that. And so I went down and did it, and Mel Jess gave me some points, and first week in March, there we started, and I started with Frank Butel. I was the color guy, but not only did I do the analyst, I had to do all the interviews. So I had to run downstairs, I don't know if it was 58 steps or something, down at the end of every period, interview somebody, back up, and do all the games. So I did all the games and all the interviews. That's the end of the game. Greenway wins his first state championship. Here's Lou Nanny. We'll try and talk to a few of the individual stars here. Of course, they're all stars. Were you guys worried about Johnson at all? Oh, worry. You bet we were. Congratulations. How do you feel? Great. Just great. Well, we'll get back up to Frank. That's about all we can do from here. It's a happy Coleraine Club tonight. And I did that. For years, I was happy when we finally moved out of St. Paul for a while because that was tough going up and down those stairs all the time. When you talk to people from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, frankly, when they come in, still to this day, they say, I hear they sell out this arena for a high school hockey game. How is that even possible? When you describe it to other people, have you had the same experience? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's been a good fortune. I was streaming everything. They see it all over. But this has been seen for a long time. If you look at the scouts, Scotty Bowman coming here. Scotty was one of the first guys in the NHL to really get devoted to that tournament. He stole Phil Housley. Who would have taken Housley? I think fifth overall out of high school, who becomes a Hall of Fame player. We had a scout at the time when I was with Buffalo that 
Phil played high school hockey with South St. Paul, and we got very lucky because he was a junior, and everybody kind of noticed him. And the next year, his team didn't make the tournament, and nobody could see him, and except my scout, Rudy Me, the late Rudy Miguel, knew of him, and we were quite happy. I've watched Phil play now for the past three years, and I've seen his progress, and uh, I know the impact he's going to have on our Buffalo fans. And, uh, you know, uh, he's a great hockey player, and his, his play is very entertaining. Phil was, is a Hall of Fame player, uh, and he came out of high school. He, to play high school hockey and then bypass university hockey, bypass the Olympic team, come right in the NHL, uh, there wasn't very many that were as good, and he was not a big man either. He was, but he's a great skater, and he has a great record. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame. You mentioned Phil Housley as a player who probably put himself on the map in the tournament. Have you seen other examples like that? Well, there's a few. First of all, Spihar got, you know, a hat trick in every game. That's tremendous. Uh, the goaltender from uh, Centennial shut out every game. That's tremendous. Then. Tim Sheehy, when I first started in 64, he was with International Falls, Larry Ross's team. He just dominated like I can't believe. And Boucher would have, he got hurt or he might have dominated all the way through. I think uh, Broughton's, of course, the whole line. There was Neil Aaron and Erickson, uh, and Neil and his brother Aaron, and Erickson were all three small guys. Yet they were so talented, so good, so exciting, when, you know, that Rosso team. The longer I think, the more I, I see guys that that have, uh, have done exceptionally well, that went on to have great careers as well. Shaver Press Box, XL Energy Center, along with Lou Nanny on Jim Erickson. Double A semifinals. And Luke, what do you expect tonight? Well, I expect a real good game between these two teams. A tight game. If Creighton can control the neutral zone the way they did yesterday, and Edina can check better than they did yesterday. And a semifinal, the puck is down. And here we go. It's always exciting. That's why every year you come, you get all revved up, and to see the kind of quality of play and the enthusiasm of the kids and the fans, the bands. It's just a, a new experience every year that never ceases to get dull. Centering pass and score! What a great shot by the body. That puck barely touched his stick, an excellent touch to get in the net. And the body beat the goaltender so quickly he didn't have a chance to react. You know, he's the voice of the state tournament. He will always be, you know, until he hangs up. He's, he started doing this 59 years ago. Each year, the eight regional hockey champs arrive in St. Paul, ready to do battle before capacity crowds of the St. Paul Auditorium. It's been something that I've treasured ever since I started doing it in 64. But to progress through the years and see the tournament grow, see the talent grow, and still be able to come here and be excited about what's going to happen, on and on, it seems to get more exciting every year. And I've had the good fortune of broadcasting everything in hockey, the Stanley Cup, the Olympics, and it's all been a thrill, but exciting. But the toughest games I've ever had to work, we were working the ones with my family. My son was playing in the championship game in the third period, and he came down and uh, he was able to score a goal, which turned out to be the championship winner. Here comes Hankinson for Nanny, scores! Hankinson with a great play. He slips that puck through to Marty Nanny. Marty Nanny with a good idea on the play. Don't fool around with it, get it on the net. He did, a rebound was there, and he just went after it and put it in. Having watched it my whole life, and to have my dad still calling the games was great. More importantly, to have our team win was incredible. And then to, to have him be able to take a deep breath and uh, celebrate after. And, Obviously a big moment in his life, obviously a huge moment in my life, and it's great to share it together. I always say I try and keep it neutral above, but my stomach was churning, and you can't help it if it's family. And then I had the opportunity to call the games for his two sons. First, Louis, who was captain of the Edina team, and they won the state championship. And then his younger brother, Tyler, was also captain of the team, and, and he came in and he won the state championship. Will the captains please come forward? Come down. It's as good as it gets. It's Texas State football, but you know, on steroids, I think it's uh, 
Something that every kid dreams about. That's definitely the, the pinnacle of my career is winning the state tournament, you know, having Gramps announce it and seeing the family in the stands and, and it's something that you can really be proud about. That was a part of your TV experience. You also did some broadcasting while you were the general manager for the North Stars. I, I had the good fortune, ABC was doing the game of the week. And up to that point, my last year when I was playing, this is the most unusual thing ever. They asked if I could do the game in a week on Mondays. Because our team was so bad, they had no Monday games. So I used to play Sunday night somewhere, fly to a game Monday, I'd do the game of the week, and then I'd, you know, we'd be off till Tuesday, and I'd fly in meet them on Tuesday. So I was doing the NHL games then. When I became general manager, then ESPN got the rights to college hockey. So I worked their games for years there. And then I did the Olympics for ABC Radio in 84. When you were the general manager back in those days, the TV was a little less rigid, perhaps, in the way it was structured. There are stories that you used to dictate when TV timeouts would get taken when the North Stars perhaps were struggling a little. Is there truth to those? Yeah, there is. <laughs> the press box, you know, you, you, we had the TV broadcasters up there too. So I'd run down and say, get a timeout. <laughs> We need a timeout. And I also used to say, don't call a timeout. You know, if our team's going really well, we had them on the ropes, don't call a timeout. <laughs> a little different than it is today. You couldn't do that. Louis answers the phone. He said, who's this? I said, it's Tino Lettieri. And he said, um, mm, do me a favor. Don't call back here again. And that was it. Lou Nanny, Canadian-born, Minnesotan at heart, is presented by Northland Ford. Visit buyfordnow.com and your local Northland Ford dealer today. And by Hyundai, it's your journey. Your family is a very important part of your life as well. How did you meet Francine? Uh, she moved right around the corner from me and, and uh, I'll never forget one day, it was, they used to have a place called Tasty Freeze and uh, it was right in the corner and I went to get a Tasty Freeze one day and here I see this girl coming in an orange jacket and black pants and I'm watching and looking, she's getting prettier and prettier as she gets closer and closer. And so she bugs everybody and tells me that when I went to school, the school was only two blocks down the right side of my house and she was around the corner on the left. He didn't have to go to buy, buy my house to go to school but he sure made an effort to go by my house all the time because he saw this little French girl with the braids, and uh, that was it. She couldn't speak English when I first met her. In fact, when I first asked her out, I had to ask her mother in English, and her mother talked to her in French to tell her, you know, what I wanted. I wanted to go to the dance when I was a freshman in high school, and she was still in the seventh grade. So after I took her out, then I started, you know, dating her, which her father wasn't too happy about because he was French and I'm Italian. My mother loved him. My father was afraid of him. My father, no, just because he was Italian, she, he wanted, he thought, why couldn't I like a French guy? Well, I didn't like a French guy. I liked the Italian guy. And the French are very provincial, but I guess so are we as Italians. So we had to battle through that for seven years. You were 14, she was 12? Right. You've been together ever since? We celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary, uh, August 27th. I got married, I was 19. And moving from Sault Ste. Marie, where I'd been nowhere, uh, I thought, where is Minnesota? Where are we going? What are we gonna do there? He said, well, I've got a scholarship. And so, it was fabulous. I always liked my role of being a, a mom and being there for the kids and so that he could do his work. So when we had our children, I just always felt the same way that be close and look out for each other and uh, help each other. The rest is history because we've had a beautiful life. She was uh, his biggest fan, biggest supporter, and she knew what was important to him. And she's lived through a lot and uh, put up with a lot, but uh, he wouldn't be where he is today without her. Well, she's the best. And she, uh, she's unique. She's, uh, I can remember from when she was growing up, she had to take care of 10 before. She, <laughs> she's six shy right now, so she, She's fortunate she has all the grandkids and great-grandkids to take care of because it just gives her a continuation of where she uh, began. 
Well, I came here in the end of 1976, right after the Montreal Olympic Games. The Minnesota Kicks had a game at the Met Center when we had an indoor team. After the game, I happened to go watch the uh, Minnesota North Stars play and walk in the concourse. I met this girl and uh, I asked her, you know, if she wanted to go have a coffee here, you know. So she gave me her number and I uh, called the number and uh, Louis answers the phone. I said, is Michelle there? And he said, who's this? And I, I paused for a moment and I, I said, it's Tino Latieri. And he said, um, hmm, do me a favor, don't call back here again. Hung up the phone and that was it. Fast forward, Minnesota Kicks folds in 1981. I go play for Vancouver Whitecaps. The first game I was here, we played a game at the Dome. I happened to be after the game sitting at a bar. Mind you, it was four years later, I hadn't seen Michelle or talked to Louie. And neither of these three girls walk in and one of the girls comes up to me and says, you remember me? I looked at her, I said, Michelle. And then we started off again, trying to, second time around, trying to meet Louie again. We always thought of having a place where we could all gather. So we just like to see it continue because we like to see our family close so our family knows that they have support of one another throughout their life. And I think that's really important. Lou and Francine, they're uh, the patriarch and matriarch of our family and they bought the cabin that we're at just to keep every single kid and grandkid in town. We celebrate every holiday together and it's, it's all thanks to Lou and Francine. The family's gotten so close that even when the kids were at the University of Minnesota, not only they were cousins, but they were friends. So they always hang around together. Growing up, obviously, with the family being a gopher family, you want to carry that on. And fortunately for me, it all worked out. And, and you know, like everything happens for a reason, I think. All the stars aligned, and I was able to, to play at the U for three years, and best three years of my life. And they score the gophers right away. To look at the, the wall of all the captains, it's it's pretty special. And it's not just hockey, it's it's family. And you know, I get emotional talking about it. It's, it's something that he uh, is really passionate about. And uh, we're just happy to have him. Honestly, didn't really know who my grandpa was from a hockey standpoint until I really grew up and all I knew was that he was he was my grandpa and especially having the exact same name was a blessing and a curse but the way he lives his life it was more of a blessing than a curse. Going back to when I signed with the Gophers, the craziest part was going out of that tunnel for my first game in Minnesota and having beef with the Gophers is a huge thing as a Minnesota boy. He's been there not only for myself, but for all my cousins, whether it's sports, whether it's academics, jobs, no matter what it is, he's always our biggest supporter, and he hasn't missed many games of mine. Feet across, score! Vinny Latiri in his NHL debut! And there's the family on their feet, yes! What a moment! I'm lucky enough to have him and my dad and all my other family members support me and mentor me growing up and just lucky enough to be around them. I think it's to me just one of the coolest things ever and not only for myself but for my family. To put on the wild jersey is uh, pretty symbolic for my family and for myself so I'm very excited and I think it's going to be an awesome opportunity. You never know when something bad's going to happen and you're not going to have that opportunity to do and live the way you're used to living. So what do you do? You don't stop until you have no choice. As you tell all these stories about your life in hockey, just about every name that is a big name in Minnesota hockey has at some point in their lives, in your life, you've crossed paths played for them, played with them, coached with them, managed them. What do you look at as your legacy in terms of hockey in Minnesota? Well, I, I, I'd have to say really helping to expand the game throughout the state and uh, hopefully making people understand it better. Supporting like the university teams that uh, needed my support, the ways 
that I might be able to be of assistance to them to help them grow the game, grow the product, and, and uh, grow the interest. Sixty years ago, you were holding out and yeah. <laughs> saying, I'm going into business rather than playing hockey. Sixty yeah. years later, you're still in the hockey business. That's a pretty amazing run. That's unbelievable. I mean, uh, when you think of that, and, and the, uh, there's not a day that I can't think of somebody somewhere that I had you know, fun times with or, or really enjoyed being with through the hockey business, the hockey world. I've had the good fortune of seeing so many different kids play, so many coaches, experiences, uh, teams start hockey, be successful in hockey. So enjoyable, I can't tell you. He garners a crowd wherever he goes. A lot of people want to talk to Lou, everybody wants to meet Lou. You know, we're up here in the booth at the XL Energy Center uh, getting ready for a broadcast. Uh, people want to come in and, and, and say hi to Lou. He's always so accessible, always has time for people. He is uh, just so supportive of Minnesota hockey and he's proud of uh, the state, he's proud of the players. Doing the state high school tournament has kept him young as well as doing his radio show. Nobody's meant more to Minnesota hockey. My name is Dan Barrero. I am joined in studio. It's our guy Luigi, Lou Nanny. Part of the reason that he remains relevant and that I think kids like listening to him is, Louie is not automatically a back in my day guy. I think Louie is smart enough to understand things do evolve, things do change, you know, time marches on. You never get short change when you go to a game at the, watch Minnesota Wild. They, they always, always give effort. There are going to be nights when you're off physically, when you can't handle the puck well, you can't pass the puck well. But uh, overall, you always get your money's worth when you go watch the Wild play. Where it turned with Louie is when we didn't just talk hockey with him. We talked other sports. We talked about life things from time to time, which we have done. That's what I'm most proud of is even non-hardcore hockey people, I think, are willing to listen to an hour of a guy who's associated more than anything else with hockey, but other people are very much into listening to what he has to say with us. Final inductee coming up, someone who probably does not really need much of an introduction, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, Lou Nanny, synonymous with Minnesota hockey, legendary coach John Mariucci said to him, Louie, if you come here, you're never going to leave. And we're sure glad to be 60 years later, he's still here. Ladies and gentlemen, Lou Nanny. Well, he's an icon. There's no doubt about that. And he has been since he played. It's off the charts. Well, he's done a great deal for the game here. You know, uh, really a unique resume. A guy who came from Northern Ontario, played hockey in the U.S., became a U.S. citizen to play in the U.S. Olympic team, was a proud proponent of Minnesota high school hockey, Minnesota college hockey. And I really think you could argue he became the face of hockey in, in Minnesota. And uh, you know, Minnesota hockey scene is better for him. Minnesota to him is so important. He goes to so many events and he knows so many people. He's been an important part of my life and uh, he doesn't know that as much as uh, we do. And, uh, his, I, but I appreciate having been involved with him. He's been instrumental in a lot of the good things that have happened in hockey, not just here in Minnesota, but internationally and uh, deservedly uh, gets all the awards and, and, and accolades that he should get because he has helped uh, certainly grow the game all over the world. He's very connected with hockey for a long time. If a person asked me to describe him in one word, I would say friendly. As friendly a person as you could ever meet. And uh, it wasn't much he didn't do. He's been around, he's seen it, done it all. He's been every job <laughs> description in hockey available, uh, but he's, he's always been you know, a Minnesota guy. It's kind of neat that he stayed here and is made for this game, and especially made for the game to be in this state. He's got a real true hockey heart, as I would say. It's fun to have a friend like that. I would trust Louis with my life. God bless him, man. Good for Louis, but you're still older than me. <laughs> There's probably not a hockey name I could come up with that he's not connected with. He's history. 
Here's a guy who has seen everything at every level in hockey. He has not lost any of that passion. It's everything to him. There's a book by uh, John Irving called The World According to Garp. The main character, Garp's mom, says to him at one point, you know, everybody dies. My parents died, your father died, everybody dies. I'm gonna die too, so will you. The thing is to have a life before we die. It can be a real adventure having a life. Louis, to me, defines exactly that. This guy is having a life. I, I choke up thinking about it. He's the guy who understands that we are all terminal cases. You never know when something bad's gonna happen and you're not gonna have that opportunity to do and live the way you're used to living. So what do you do? You don't stop until you have no choice. Vinny letary has been called up to the big club and now he's here, so tell me about how does it feel? Well, it feels, uh, I'm living the dream. I'm actually living the dream. I'm very fortunate, you know, uh, just to have him up there. You know, I, I had the good fortune of having my whole career with Minnesota. And if you say, what would you like to see? I said, mm, I'd like to see either my kids or my grandkids play for Minnesota's team, because that's where I spent my career. So I'm living a dream. Almost feels like your first game again when you go go play at home. It means a whole lot, not just to me, but to my family for everything they've done, and, and we're really excited. It really gets very intense and hard on me to watch him play. I that's why I want to be alone. I, I have to do these things. I have to, that's the only way I can ease my mind. And it's stupid. It's crazy. I wish I never did it. That's why I got out of hockey, because it takes a toll on you, but it's worth suffering tonight. Come on, come on. Crank him. That a boy. Go, go. Yes! A much-needed win in front of the home fans here tonight, and a dominating victory over the visiting Oilers. You can't dream of a life like I've had. When I start thinking of all the good fortune I've had in my life and in our life, where we've been, what we've been able to do, I'm having a life that I enjoy and I want to do. If I didn't want to do what I want to do now, I'd quit, but I, I enjoy doing it. I love the people that I'm with. That's why I said I, I can't believe how fortunate I've been.